Okay, let's talk about basic critical care cardiac ultrasonography. Um, I've taken the basic cardiac content and divided it into two talks. Uh, the first part uh, will be this talk, which will be sort of an introduction uh, and an overview of how cardiac ultrasonography fits into the critical care assessment, and also uh, an introduction to the, the, the six standard views that we use to assess uh, the heart. And then the second part will be the actual assessment, and we'll talk about the basics of things like the LV assessment, the RV assessment, pericardial assessment, and things like that in part two. But let's start with part one, intro and, and the views. Um, so like I mentioned before, um, all of point of care ultrasonography, critical care ultrasonography, um, your assessment as a clinician uh, should be revolving around a clinical question. You are going into the patient room with a question in your mind uh, and using the ultrasound to help you answer that question. When you're talking about cardiac ultrasound, more often than not, the question you're asking is, why is this patient in shock? Uh, and more importantly, what should I do about it? Should I give volume? Should I give vasopressors? That kind of thing. And once I've decided on intervention, how well or how poorly is that patient responding to the chosen intervention? So shock is really the reason why we do echoes uh, as intensivists and as critical care practitioners. So when I go into a patient's room with the ultrasound, trying to assess why they're in shock, I always keep in mind, I keep, try to keep in mind that the four hemodynamic subtypes of shock, because I think it helps you uh, sort of frame uh, the assessment and, and help you sort of think through uh, the uh, clinical assessment as you get your views. So when you think about it, the four subtypes of shock, cardiogenic, obstructive, hypovolemic, and distributive, and you think about all the specific things that cause the various subtypes of shock, you can see really how powerful ultrasound is in giving you a direct and very quick uh, idea of what's going on in that patient when they're, when they're in a shock state. So when we break down the various types of cardiogenic shock, LV dysfunction, RV dysfunction, severe valve insufficiency, and dysrhythmias, you can see that ultrasound can directly assess these things very quickly and give you an idea of whether one or more of these things is happening. Uh, I put arrhythmias on there, so clearly you're not diagnosing most arrhythmias by using ultrasound. Uh, but um, when you're doing things like trying to assess for ROSC in the setting of cardiac arrest, the use of ultrasonography is, is more and more uh, being shown to be a useful uh, um, adjunct, a useful driver of your, of your assessment. So again, when we're going in and, and looking at uh, the heart, you're asking yourself, is this shock because of LV dysfunction? Is it because of RV dysfunction or valve insufficiency? Or again, is there, is there a dysrhythmia that's, that's contributing to the shock state? Similar with obstructive shock, RV strain from a massive PE, for example, pericardial tamponade, tension pneumothorax, these things are very easily and very directly identifiable uh, using ultrasonography. Hypovolemic and distributive shock look um, essentially the same on ultrasound. Uh, and if you think about it, uh, it's because both of them are really hypovolemic shock states. Uh, with hypovolemic shock, you actually have an absolute hypovolemia from volume loss, either because of hemorrhage or volume depletion. Distributive shock is more of a relative hypovolemia where you have, uh, I guess, a constant blood volume, but it's distributed over a larger vascular surface area. But they're really both hypovolemic shock states. So they look very similar on ultrasound. And that's okay because the primary therapy for both of these shock states is volume, volume resuscitation. So these really the question you're trying to ask and answer with ultrasound is, is there a volume responsive shock state that's present that would respond to a fluid bolus or blood or what have you? So in summary, the use of ultrasound in shock helps you one, identify the shock subtype or the shock physiology that's in play. Number two, it helps you identify the specific etiology that may be causing the shock state, LV dysfunction, valve insufficiency. And then based on your assessment, you can choose your therapy. And like I said before, the assessment is powerful, but the reassessment adds to the yield of your study. So once you've chosen an intervention, you can use your ultrasound to help you figure out how well or how poorly they're responding to your chosen intervention. And you kind of do that cycle until you've gotten to the clinical uh, situation where uh, you're trying to get to. So if you sort of break down the mechanics of how you assess someone who's in shock, um, you start with your cardiac ultrasound. So like I said, that's the cornerstone of your shock evaluation. Look at the heart, try to figure out the physiology that's going on, try to figure out a specific etiology. And then based on what you see with your echo, with your cardiac ultrasound, you can then branch off into your other subtypes, your other modalities in ultrasound. For example, if you see someone who has a hyperdynamic LV and a dilated IVC, 
um, especially if they've had thoracic trauma, looking for evidence of pneumothorax would be great. So looking for lung sliding or lung point would be the next best thing to do. If you have someone that uh, you've done an echo on, they're in shock and you see a dilated RV, looking for a DVT would be a good, uh, good thing to do, especially if they're too unstable to get a CT scan, for example. So this is how you go about your shock evaluation. You start with your cardiac assessment as sort of your cornerstone, your cornerstone, and then you branch out to your other modalities to help you figure out specifically what's going on. Okay, but this talk again will be on the cardiac component of the shock evaluation. Um, when I talk about cardiac ultrasound, um, I like to divide them into a basic skill set and knowledge set and an advanced skill and knowledge set. The basic skill set is what we're going to, you know, get into today, and it consists of essentially largely a two-dimensional assessment of cardiac function and cardiac structure, a little bit of color Doppler, and a little bit of M mode. When you start going from a qualitative assessment, which is essentially your basic assessment, into a quantitative assessment, you're trying to measure things like pressure and stroke volume, cardiac output, that kind of thing, then you transition from basic to advanced echo, in my opinion. So when you start bringing in things like quantitative Doppler, that is transitioning into advanced uh, cardiac ultrasound. And more and more in the critical care setting, uh, we are using transesophageal echo uh, to assess people who are in shock, but may not have adequate windows to get you enough information from a TTE. Uh, so you can grab the TE and throw it down and see if you can get uh, some information using transesophageal echo. Um, but this talk again will be on basic cardiac ultrasound. And there is a series of subsequent talks that we will talk about some advanced content. So let's talk about scanning. Um, you are going to be using your phased array probe for all the cardiac stuff, at least in the, on the critical care uh, cardiac assessment. You'll use the cardiac preset. So remember when we talked about the various presets, I highlighted the cardiac preset uh, because it is a setting where you have a relatively high frequency. So if you look at the frequency range on your phased array probe between one and five megahertz, when you choose cardiac setting, it sets the frequency to the higher range up to the five megahertz level. Uh, and then it turns up your frame rate. So it allows you the ability to get high resolution of a relatively superficial structure, which is the heart, and a structure that's moving quickly, which is the heart. So a cardiac preset on your phase rate probe. And instead of using planes in relation to the body, where long axis is dot or indicator pointed up to the head, and transverse axis is the dot or indicator pointed to the patient right, in cardiac ultrasound, the long and the short planes axes are in relation to the axis of the heart. Okay, and we'll, we'll go through that, I think, ad nauseum as we talk about all the views. We'll talk about the plane of the heart and we'll talk about how the views uh, set you up in relation to the axis or the plane of the heart. And based on that, we use six standard views in the critical care cardiac assessment, which are the peritoneal long, and I typically do it in this order, the peritoneal long, peritoneal short, apical four chamber, subcostal long axis, subcostal short axis, and finally your IVC view. And we're going to go through these in the next several slides uh, in, in a lot of detail. And what I will say, and I will say this over and over again, is the reliability and quality of your cardiac assessment is directly, uh, directly dependent on the quality of your views. And by quality of your views, I largely mean if you're on or off axis. Uh, and I'll say this over and over again, an off axis image versus an on axis image will significantly affect the accuracy of your assessment. And if you don't recognize on versus off axis, it could potentially make you uh, go into clinical errors uh, in, in your assessment. For example, over or under uh, calling LV dysfunction uh, based on an on or off axis image, over or under calling RV size or other, other than another mistake you can make uh, based on an off axis image. So knowing what an on axis image is and all these six views is very important because it's going to make you uh, uh, allow you to be as precise and as accurate as possible with your with your cardiac assessment. Okay, so I'll say that over and over again. Okay, access is very important, and it becomes important not only in your basic assessment, but when you start making measurements and calculating velocities and things like that. If you're doing that in your, in your advanced assessment, if you're doing that on an off-axis image, uh, there is going to be a significant amount of inaccuracy that translates uh, into your uh, your, your quantitative assessment. So it's really important to uh, know what on or off axis is. So let's talk first about the peristeral long axis view. 
So peristernal long axis view uh, is uh, a long axis view on the chest up against the sternum. And like I said before, all of the planes of your imaging uh, are rel relative to the axis of the heart. So if you look at how the heart sits in your chest, it sits sort of obliquely like this, such that the long axis of the heart is this way and the short axis is this way. So if we're trying to get a peristernal long axis view, we're gonna, we're going to uh, align the probe so that the axis of the probe itself, the axis of the, the scan itself is parallel to the long axis of the heart. So the way we do that in the peristernal view is we put the probe up against the sternum, just lateral to the sternum on the chest. Most of the time at along the nipple line is a good place to start. And you want to uh, direct the indicator to the right shoulder. So if you do that, you will slice the heart in this direction. In other words, you'll get a slice that looks like this, right through the long axis of the heart. So if you were to take that slice and crack the heart open like a coconut and look inside, this is what you would see, okay? Um, the other thing I uh, forgot to mention is that uh, when you um, go from abdominal or lung preset to cardiac preset, in every other preset, the dot on the screen on your ultrasound machine, on the ultrasound screen, is at screen left. So that um, anything on the side of the dot is presented to be on screen left. Uh, that is the opposite when you switch to your cardiac preset. On the cardiac preset, the indicator moves to the screen right. Um, so when you're looking at the heart and your dot is pointed to patient right, like it is in the peripheral long axis view, Instead of that structure that's on patient right, like the base of the heart appearing on screen left, like it would if you're looking at a chest X-ray or a CT, um, it's switched. So patient right is actually on screen right and patient left is on screen left. Okay, so it's sort of a uh, flip of the normal sort of anatomic imaging uh, orientation that we're used to. Okay, the cardiologists like to switch things up a bit. Okay, so everything's sort of going to be backwards. Okay, so the base of the heart will be over here on screen right. The apex of the heart will be screen left. And if you look at that as an ultrasound image, it's going to look like this. So here is a uh, properly quality controlled peripheral long axis view. Okay, so like I said before, I'm going to uh, really harp on the importance of axis um, and uh, quality control when it comes to these images because you have to know what to. Uh, shoot for uh, in order to get a good image. And if you can't get a good image, and, and, and what I mean by that is an on-axis image, then you have to know the limitations of the off-axis image, okay? So let's talk about what an on-axis peristernal long-axis view should look like, okay? So here's the peristernal long-axis view. There's the LV, there's the mitral valve, the left atrium, the aortic valve, the left ventricular outflow tract, and the right ventricular outflow tract and you have the descending aorta here. So in order for this view to be on axis or properly quality controlled, you wanna achieve a few things. Number one, you want the heart to be as horizontal in lie on the screen as possible. So horizontal LV. Number two, you want the LV to be as long as possible. Number three, you do not wanna see the apex because the way that the heart is tilted in the chest, when you put the probe in the peristernal long axis view, you're not gonna see the apex. Okay, if you see what looks like an apex, it's actually not, it's actually a false apex and it means you're cutting obliquely through the heart. And now when we talk about the various um, assessments, we'll talk about uh, the errors you can make uh, if you're off axis. Okay, but specifically with something like uh, LV function, if you're cutting the heart obliquely, you're going to be cutting through more muscle and less chamber, so it could potentially make the LV function look better than it actually is. Okay. So it's important to be on axis. Long horizontal LV, no apex. You want to see both the mitral valve and the aortic valve in the same shot. And you want the view to be deep enough, the depth to be set deep enough such that you can see the descending aorta, which is right here. Now you're sort of seeing it in, in, cross, uh, in, uh, in cross section. Okay, so probably a little bit too much depth here but you want enough depth so that you can see the descending aorta. Okay, so let's say that again. Long horizontal LV, no visible apex. 
mitral valve, aortic valve in the same view, and the descending aorta is visible in your shot. Okay. This view is good for a number of things. It's good to get a sort of global assessment of LV function. It is good to identify evidence of severe mitral and aortic insufficiency. It is good for identifying pericardial effusions and pleural effusions. Okay, so the difference between pericardial and pleural is a pericardial effusion. You'll see a fluid stripe here, posterior to the heart, but it will, as it gets goes sort of below the heart here, it will go between the heart and the descending aorta, or the fluid stripe will thin out before it hits the descending aorta. So it'll sort of, you know, uh, go in between the heart and the aorta. Whereas a pleural effusion, a fluid stripe would be here, and it would actually go posterior to the descending aorta. So that's why it's important to visualize the descending aorta in this view, okay? So LV function, valve insufficiency, pericardial, and pleural effusions are the big things that this view is, is good for. Uh, this view is not good for assessing RV size because this is just a small piece of the RV we're looking at. We're just looking at the RV outflow track. Um, so the fact that the RV looks normal in this view does not necessarily mean that the RV is not dilated. You're just getting a small piece of it. If it's dilated in this view, on the other hand, that means it is, it is, it is large, okay? So that's peripheral long axis view. Um, so in order to achieve these things that I was talking about, the low, the long horizontal LV, the no apex, the, the two valves visible, um, you, you should make adjustments or, or uh, assure that you're in these positions in this following order, okay? So the first thing you wanna do is you wanna remember the name of the view. The name of the view is peristernal long axis. So you wanna put the probe on the chest and you want it to be as close to the sternum as possible. Right on the side, as close to the sternum as possible. So parasternal. And what this is gonna help you do is, is to optimize the horizontal lie of the heart. The more lateral you get, the more oblique of views you're gonna get in the heart, the more sort of vertical it's gonna look in your view. Okay, so the first thing you wanna do, if you put the probe down and don't see what you wanna see, make sure you're as medial as possible on the chest, as close to the sternum as possible without actually being on the sternum. The second thing you wanna optimize is rotation. So you wanna rotate and make sure the dot is pointed to the right shoulder. But remember, not everyone's heart is exactly in that plane. So if you put the probe on the chest and you're seeing what looks like an apex, meaning you have an oblique cut through the heart, the problem oftentimes is rotation. So just sort of micro rotate a little bit to try and align the plane of the probe with the plane of the heart, okay? And then finally, the last thing you do to adjust is angulation. So remember, angulation is changing the angle of the probe perpendicular to the axis of the heart, okay? And that's gonna allow you to visualize both the mitral and aortic valves in the same shot. It's gonna help you scan through the heart, okay? So once again, to optimize the view, make sure you're as medial on the chest as possible, make sure your rotation is optimized, and then finally, make sure your angulation is optimized in that order. The next view is the peristernal short axis view. So again, if this is the long axis of the heart, the short axis would be this way. So to achieve that view, you take the indicator from the peristernal long view and rotate it 90 degrees so that it points to the patient's left shoulder. And so what you'll get is a cut through the heart like this, which will look like that. And on the inside, you will see this. So remember, dot, is on screen right. Um, so you'll see RV over here and LV over here. And on ultrasound, it'll look like this. So you have LV here, this round you know, chamber here, you're looking at the LV sort of down through the barrel. And then you have the RV over here, which is sort of a conical shaped structure. Yeah, I like to think of this as, a, as an ice cream cone. Um, and the kid who has the cone doesn't like the flavor, so they're dumping out the ice cream. Um, so there's the cone, there's your ice cream, okay? Um, in, in order for this view to be properly quality controlled, you have to achieve a couple things here. One, I will say, uh, just sort of quality wise, the gain is set too high in this, in this view. Okay, so remember I said in order for gain to be optimally set, 
you need the fluid filled structures to be black or anechoic. And you want the gain to be high enough so that the surrounding structures are differentiable from the anechoic fluid. In this case, the fluid filled heart here is not black. So the gain is set too high. Otherwise, it's so, this is a well quality controlled view. Okay, so in a normal heart, you want the LV to be round. And in general, you want the, you know, the, the, the interventricular septum here to, to be about center on the screen. Okay. And you want to be at the papillary muscle level. So this thing here and this thing here are your papillary muscles. They're like two boxing gloves coming together as the heart contracts. Okay. And you want those two boxing gloves to look the same. You want this papillary muscle to look about the same as this papillary muscle. And what that means is you're cutting the LV and you're cutting the papillary muscles through the same sort of section, which means you're cutting it truly through the short axis, okay? If these two don't look the same, so for example, if you're seeing boxing glove-shaped papillary muscle on this side, but fluttering cordae on this side, that means you're getting an oblique cut through the heart, okay? So to make sure that you're truly getting a short axis view, you want both papillary muscles to be as symmetric as possible, okay? Um, and again, in order to do that, medial position on the chest. So remember, peristernal view, medial on the chest. And that again is gonna help you optimize the roundness, the true short axis of the view. Rotation is the next thing you adjust. And that's gonna help you, again, make sure you're cutting through the true short axis, okay? So again, if you put the probe there, you rotate to the short axis view and you see papillary muscle on one side, cordae on the other side, usually it's a rotation problem. So optimize and adjust your rotation so you're truly cutting through the short axis of the heart, okay? And finally, angulation, again, that will help you scan through the heart and get to the proper level, okay? So oftentimes when you rotate the probe from your peristernal long to your peristernal short, you'll typically end up at the mitral valve level or sometimes at the aortic valve level. Then what you do to get to the papillary muscle level, you would just angle posteriorly or angle down uh, to get to the papillary muscle, okay? But angulation helps you scan through the heart, okay? So again, in that order, make sure you're medial on the chest, make sure your rotation's optimized, and finally, make sure your angulation is optimized. The next view is the apical four-chamber view. Uh, this is your money shot, because uh, this gets you the most information uh, than any other single view gets you. That reminds me, I forgot to talk about why the personal short axis view is clinically useful. There's two things you can get out of the personal short axis view. One is an assessment of LV function. And two, septal shape and septal motion. This is the best view to look at septal shape and septal motion. And when we talk about the assessment, we'll talk about why that's important. Okay, apical four. So like I said, this is your money shot. You can get the most information from this view than from any other single view uh, of, of the six views. Okay, so the idea is you're trying to put the probe down at the PMI and you're trying to slice up at the heart. Okay, so what you want to do is you want to imagine, and you can, you can feel for the PMI as well if you want, uh, but, you know, put the probe down at the apex of the heart. So in general, the best place to start in men is you find a nipple, and go lateral and inferior to the nipple. In females, find the inframammary crease. And in most women, if you put the probe at the lateral most part of the inframammary crease, that'll be about where the uh, apex of the heart is, okay? But you have, to, you have to be sort of unafraid to move the probe around to find where the true apex is, okay? But in general, the best way to find it is to think low and lateral. So inferior and lateral on the chest, um, and then gradually move more and more medial until you run into the heart. So I sometimes tell people, go so um, inferior and lateral that you see the spleen, and then gradually move the probe up, and so sort of up and medial until you run into the heart. If you do that, the first view of the heart you get, more often than not, will actually be the apex. Okay, so low and lateral. And the marker here, is actually gonna be uh, a little bit more uh, directed, you know, down towards, so sort of in between the shoulder and down towards the bed, in between that, okay? 
So the, the, uh, the dot's not gonna be pointed down towards the bed, not gonna be pointed up at the shoulder, it'll be pointed in between the two, okay? Sort of down this way, okay? So that's the cut you're trying to get. And that's the view you're trying to see. So here's your a well quality controlled apical four chamber view. Like I said, this is the most useful view out of all the other single views. It's also the hardest view to get. Um, typically how they get this view in, in, uh, in an echo lab is they'll turn the patient all the way on their left side with the arm behind their head. And there's a little cutout in the table where they'll put the probe in to get a true apical view. So it's a difficult view to get. Imagine trying to do that in someone who's in the ICU. Um, difficult view to get for that reason. Okay, so in order, the best way to optimize this is to try your best to turn the patient on their left side if you can and uh, abduct uh, the, the left arm, okay? But this is a view that was obtained in the, in the MICU, so it is possible, okay? But this is a, a properly quality controlled apical four chamber view. So what we're looking for is a few things uh, to know that this is on axis. One, the overall shape of the heart should be, should be long. So um, if you imagine it looks like a rugby ball or a football, so you want the heart to be long and pointy, okay? You want the apex of the LV to be sort of at the top of the pyramid here, the top of the cone. And you want that apex to be thin, okay? So the apex is normally thinner than the rest of the LV. So it should have, if, if you're truly at the apex, the uh, apex here will look thinner than the rest of the, uh, rest of the heart. There is a variant of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy where the apex is thick and thicker, asymmetrically thicker than the other parts of the heart, but that is very uncommon. Um, so if you are trying to get an apical four chamber view and you see a thick apex, it's probably not because of apical hokum, it's probably your view. Uh, it's probably that you're off axis. Okay. So long football or rugby shaped heart, thin LV apex. You want the septum to be vertical and you want the two chambers here, the RV and the LV to sort of drape over that vertical septum. And you want all four chambers to be visible. Again, RV, LV, right atrium, right ventricle. And you want both valves to be visible, the mitral valve and the tricuspid valve, okay? So again, long football shaped pointy heart, thin apex, vertical septum, all four chambers, both valves visible. This view is good for a lot of things. It's good for looking at LV function. This is the only view where you can accurately judge RV size. Um, and we'll talk about how to do that. You can also look at RV function and you can put color over the valves to look for evidence of severe valve insufficiency in the mitral valve here. And then when we move on to estimating right-sided pressures, uh, looking for TR in this view is also good, okay? So RV, I'm sorry, LV function, RV size, RV function, valve insufficiency, okay? And you can sometimes see um, pericardial effusions here too. So very, very useful view, also difficult to get. So again, the way to optimize this view, think low and lateral on the chest. So like I said, in males, you wanna be inferior and lateral to the nipple, and you wanna imagine you're looking up at the heart. Okay, so, you know, when you put your probe down, you want to actually look up, up at the heart. Okay, so you're slicing up through this way. Okay. Um, so in men, inferior lateral to the left nipple. In females, uh, the lateral most uh, extent of the intramammary crease. Okay, and the more low and lateral you are, uh, the longer and more football shaped or rugby ball shaped your heart is going to be. Okay. Most often, um, when you see what's called a foreshortened apical four, which means instead of being football shaped, it's more of a you know soccer ball or, or volleyball, a round shape, that's called a foreshortened apical. And we'll talk about the problems with the foreshortened apical. But more often than not, the reason uh, an apical view is foreshortened is because you're too medial on the chest, okay? So if you're too medial on the chest, what's happening is you're cutting through more of the RV, uh, and you're cutting obliquely through the heart. So the heart will look round. And even more importantly, uh, to your clinical decision-making, the RV is gonna look larger than it actually is on a foreshortened apical. Okay, so you could 
potentially falsely call RV strain or coral pulmonale if you're trying to make that call with a foreshortened apical form. Okay? It'll also overestimate your LV function because again, you're cutting through more muscle and through less chamber. Okay, so low and lateral on the chest helps you get that long football shape. Rotation, so like I said, the, the indicator should point not down to the bed, not up to the left shoulder, but in between the two, okay? Um, optimal rotation will help you open up, optimize opening up both chambers, visualizing all four chambers, okay? If you're too under rotated by that, by what I mean by that is, if your dot is rotated too far pointing towards the left shoulder, what will happen is the RV will disappear behind the RV, RV will disappear behind the LV, and you'll get what's called a apical two chamber. So if you put the probe on the chest and you're just seeing two chambers, the, the LV and the LA, it means you have to rotate more clockwise uh, down towards the bed, okay? And then the third thing you do is angulation. So remember, you're trying to look up at the heart. If you're pointed too far posterior, what will happen is um, your, um, your uh, uh, atria will go away. So all you'll visualize if you're pointed too far posterior is just the two ventricles, the LV and the RV. Um, so to open up all four chambers, you have to make sure your angulation is optimal. Okay. So again, in that order, low and lateral on the chest, rotation, and angulation, okay? Starting to sound familiar. Uh, finally, you go into your subcostal views. So for your subcostal views, what you're trying to do is you're trying to get uh, just inferior to the xiphoid process, um, angling the probe to be parallel to the costal margin to look up at the heart. So what you'll do is sub, sub xiphoid, indicator pointing sort of almost down towards the left hip to be parallel to the costal margin. And then you're slicing the heart up in this direction, like this. And this is what you'll see on ultrasound. So here is the LV, the RV, right atrium, left, left atrium, mitral end, tricuspid valves. And this right here is the liver. So what you're doing here, the strategy you're using to visualize the heart here is that you're using the liver as an acoustic transmitter or as an acoustic window. The liver is a dense uh, organ um, and it helps transmit sound waves through to the heart, okay? And this is important because the stuff that lies to the left of the liver are all gas-filled organs, the stomach, the small bowel. Um, so if you are, in your subcostal view and you're seeing a bunch of air artifact, what you actually wanna do is sort of paradoxically move away from the heart, move more towards, slide the probe more towards the patient right so you can use more of the liver to um, visualize the heart, to, to act as an acoustic window, okay? Um, think of this view as having the same clinical utility, at least in your basic assessment, as the parasternal long axis view has, okay? Uh, many times, especially in the ICU, especially in patients who are mechanically ventilated, um, you can't get really good parasternal views or apical views. And oftentimes, this is sort of your bailout view. So what happens is as, you know, you're on positive pressure, um, you have PEEP or, you know, what have you, uh, it inflates the lungs. And that puts more air in between your probe and the, and the heart. So oftentimes, it can make the parasternal and apical views more difficult to get. But what it also does, it also pushes the heart down towards the belly. And so it oftentimes makes the subcostal view that much easier to get. So I sometimes call this view the bailout view because sometimes it's all you can get in someone, especially if they're on positive pressure on high levels of PEEP and that kind of thing, or are hyperinflated for any other reason, okay? Uh, so same utility as personal long, at least for your basic assessment, LV function, valvular insufficiency, um, this view is better in identifying pericardial infusions than any other view. So this is why this is view is used in the FAST exam. Um, so pericardial infusions, especially the anterior pericardial infusions are much more easily visual, visualizable in this view, okay? That's your sub, uh, subcostal long axis view. Then what you would do to get into what we call a subcostal short axis view is you would take the the indicator, take the probe and rotate the indicator from the 
uh, you know, sort of the left hip, rotate it so that the dot points up to the ceiling. So you'll cut the heart in its short axis under the, under the, uh, under the ribs. And what you'll get is something that looks like this. Going through the liver again. Here is your LV. Here is your RV. This is almost like a 90 degree rotated image when compared with the personal long, uh, personal short axis view. In the personal short, remember the RV is over here at sort of two o'clock in relation to the LV. In the subcostal short, the RV is going to be more at like one to two o'clock. So instead of 10 o'clock in the personal short, you get one to two o'clock uh, on the subcostal short. This gets you all the same information as the personal short next to you gets you. LV function, septal shape, and septal motion. Okay. If you then take the probe and angle it from pointing at the heart to pointing towards the liver, you will then bring in your IVC. Okay, so keep the dot pointed up to the ceiling, just angle the probe more towards the, the liver and you'll pick up the IVC. So this is a long X view of the IVC. Again, you have the liver here, right atrium, and here's your IVC, okay? Um, there are three things you can use to ensure that what you're looking at is the IVC and not the aorta, which can also be visible in this view. The aorta will be more posterior, but the things that tell you that this is definitively IVC are three things. One, you can see it emptying into the right atrium. So you see the cable atrial junction. Number two, you see a tributary emptying into the IVC just before it empties into the heart, and that's the hepatic vein. You can see it starting here, going out of plane, and then back into plane here. So that's your hepatic vein. And finally, the course of the IVC runs through the liver. So when the IVC goes from being the abdominal IVC to the thoracic IVC, it runs through the liver. The aorta does none of those things. The aorta does not empty into the right atrium. There is not a branch visible at this level um, at least not easily visible at this level in the aorta. And the aorta does not go through the liver, it goes posterior to the liver. Those are the three most reliable ways to determine that what you're looking at is the IVC, okay? So the point of looking at IVC usually is to look at IVC size and IVC collapsibility and variability and that type of thing. You should do all of those assessments at the thoracic IVC. So the best marker for knowing that you're in the thoracic IVC is your hepatic vein. So all of your measurements for IVC size and collapsibility and that kind of stuff should occur around the hepatic vein. Um, there are studies that look at how far out you should measure from the right atrium and that kind of thing. I just say visualize the hepatic vein, go just you know upstream from that and measure your size and your collapsibility. What you don't want to do is go way out here. This is abdominal IVC, okay? Other things can cause the abdominal IVC to vary in size. Um, other than right atrial pressures and, and volume responsiveness. So what you're trying to get to with your IVC assessment, okay? So those are your six standard views uh, and uh, uh, an overview of cardiac ultrasonography in critical care. If you have questions, please let me know. Uh, come find me or shoot me an email.